parking lot. You see anybody else or no? I'm just kidding. Well, <laughs> good morning. It's good to see you this morning. And um, a couple things. Uh, we, will be, we, will, we will be meeting tonight for our study. Next week, it's 4th of July weekend, so we will not have a Sunday evening study. But, um, but, next, uh, but tonight we are meeting. And just a reminder, we're having our lunch bunch on Wednesdays. It's, um, it's really a great time. It's a good, great fellowship there. And I'd encourage you, if you're able to come, to please come, bring a bag lunch. And we're going through the letter of Philemon. It's a beautiful letter, and we're finding the riches um, in that letter and uncovering some beautiful truths in, in Philemon. So I just pray that you'll be able to come out. And I'm also working on some possibilities right now. I've yet to hear back from the town of Moreau uh, Park. But even on Sunday nights, you know, the summer's coming, Wednesday nights, um, to go over into the park and, and to take our service, uh, evening services, and bring them somewhere in the community, whether it be at the town park or whether it be, you know, up at Cooper Park, somewhere where people can gather around and they can come and they can hear the word of the Lord and, and pray with the church. So we want to start getting out into the community and um, people would, would hear us and, and see us and know who we are. And um, also we've begun to meet for planning for the live nativity. Rita, be careful. I was going to say have a nice trip. We'll see you in the fall. But anyway, <laughs> after the fall. Um, so we, we got some things we're, we're, we're going to be planning on, but, but I'll just put this out there right now. You know, every year the, the road is closed down out here. And so we got together and we said, well, why not take part in this parade? And so um, we're going to. And so that's a long way off coming in November. But um, we're going to take part in the parade that Sunday. We'll have our worship service on that Saturday. And, and uh, it'll be really good to uh, get out there and, and meet people and share the gospel of Jesus Christ at a time when really people are, are very receptive to hearing Christmas brings people together. So um, some, some fun things and exciting things happening here in the life of the church. Gail? Oh, we're, we're, now we're going to have a we're going to have a float and manger scene and all kind. Of, we're going to be walking alongside too, so there'll be people in the float and we'll be floating. Okay. So, yeah. All right. Well, Tori, why don't you open us in prayer this morning? Dear gracious heavenly Father, thank you for all that you are um, in your greatness and your and for giving us the privilege to come and worship you today. I pray, Lord, that today in our worship we would just be in, in awe of the, the beauty of you and that you would meet us here in a special way. I pray that you would empower us with your presence to um, go out as warriors of the Lord um, because you have called us for a special purpose for such a time as this. And I pray that you would help us to see you more fully so that we may be equipped to go out and do our tasks that you have given us to do in this world. And I pray that this time of worship would be pleasing to you and that it would be bring joy and encouragement to all of us here. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's all stand together as we sing, Come Thou Fount, Come Thou King.
Certainly, we have much to praise God about today. Um, the verse that came to mind earlier today is, this is the day that the Lord has given. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. And when you think about all that God has given to you, do we really have any reason not to rejoice or be glad? This is his day. He made it. He made it for us. When we got up this morning... What were we thinking on? Were we thinking on him? Were we thinking on ourselves? Were we thinking on what burdens us or perhaps what could burden us today? Or were we just remembering, calling to remembrance all that he has done for us? All of who he is. And so this morning we have much to praise God for. We have much to praise God for this morning. And that we saw a wonderful decision by the Supreme Court. It has given power back to the states, to the people, to choose their representatives. And now we will do what we will do with that. And I'll speak about that in the message a little bit more today. But we are grateful, and I want to encourage you that the 28th, just a couple of days away, is primary day here. And so get out and vote. There's no excuse in this land that we cannot vote. So please go and vote. It's a, it's a voice in this, in this state to guide what happens in our nation. And also, perhaps the greatest blessing other than our salvation is the body of Christ. It's gathering together to worship him, to worship him in song, to worship him in the word, to worship him in our giving, to worship him in prayer, to worship him in fellowship. But we ought to come worshiping him, all of who we are, to all of who he is. So let's bow our heads together in prayer. Father, we thank you that you have made this day. Lord, I can't imagine what would happen if our hands were in the making of a day. It wouldn't look very good, but we're glad that you made today, that you've made every day in past You've made this day in the present, and you will make every day in the future until you come again. But oh, the days that you have made for us to live eternally with you, made by your hands, not with human hands. The temple that we will live in is not a temple made with human hands, for you did not reside in temples made with human hands. And Lord, by that own scripture, we can say that while we are a temple of the Holy Spirit, you are the one who has made us. You knitted us in our mother's womb. We are fearfully and wonderfully made because you have made us. Because you have made us, you have numbered our days. And you have set a purpose in each one of those days. How I pray, Father, we would do just that. 
your will, your purpose, that you receive the glory. And Lord, thank you that there is no time set in eternity. It is infinite. And Lord, for all that you have made to yourself by the grace of Jesus Christ, we thank you. We thank you, Father, for what you have ordained for us, not only today, but for tomorrow and for all eternity. And we thank you, Jesus. We thank you for the cross and for humbling yourself, being obedient unto death, even death on the cross. And I pray today, Father, that we would exalt the name of Jesus Christ, for his is the only name that should be exalted. I thank you, Father, that today, because of the cross, because of the shedding of his blood, we have the forgiveness of sins. We thank you today, Father, that because of the shedding of blood and the forgiveness of sins, the blood of Christ has covered our sin nature. And so you see only your son's blood and not who we really are. And Lord, I thank you that you have taken down the veil. You have opened it and we have access to you where we can come in relationship with you made by Christ and Christ alone. That we have been reconciled to you, O God, by Christ and Christ alone. What an awesome, mighty God. And we praise you. And we thank you and we magnify your name today, Father. Lord, perhaps there's somebody here that's hurting. The day has not begun as the day that they would consider you have made for them. But Lord, how I pray that you would turn their hearts to you. That you would call to remembrance the things that you have spoken of in the scripture. That we would all be mindful of the day that we were saved. And also, Lord, for how we were saved. And what great cost it was to you in order to save us. So we come with praising lips, grateful hearts. And we also come in prayer today, Lord. Father, the nation needs the church to rise up again. To be done with lesser things. And so, Father, today, how I pray, how we pray the Lord, we would do away with the lesser things that prevent us from doing what you have called us to do. Perhaps in this time in our nation, more than ever, it is for such a time as this that the church rise up again, O oh God. And Lord, I'm concerned that if the church does not rise up and take her rightful place, then, Lord, the devil will just keep having his way. And then God help this nation. Now is the time to come and to worship you, to bow down before you, to humble ourselves before you, Lord, to confess our sins and seek your face. And how we pray, O oh God, you would heal this land and restore it once again to how you, to how you have designed it. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. I thank you for each one who's here today. And how I pray, O oh God, that you would have your way in each one of our hearts, that we would praise your name. Lord, where you're at work in this place today, Lord, should you do something, and I, I pray you do, how I pray, Lord, that it would just shut down everything, this service as we have designed it, to, Lord, just break free. And to, rent, to surrender ourselves to how you call us. We ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. When he rolls up his sleeves, he ain't just putting on the red The thunder in his face. Lightning in his fist. Our God is an awesome God. And the Lord wasn't joking when he kicked him out of Eden. It wasn't for no reason that he shed his blood. His return is very close, and so you better be believing that our God is an awesome God. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above with and love.
All right. Well, you have your copy of God's Word with you. Would you turn to Micah chapter 6? Micah chapter 6. And before we get there, I want to give to you a little introduction into the message today, but then a deeper introduction into what is the teaching purpose behind Micah. Why is he writing this? Why has God called him to, to write this precious book? There is on all sides today shouts of great joy praising the Supreme Court's decision and there are shouts of great anger toward that decision. And in the middle is the question, what do you want from us, God? Because it's not about popping corn and sitting down be behind your favorite news station and getting all jacked up over by what Fox is saying or what CNN is saying or any other news media. Because what happens is we end up that our talking points are nothing more than the anchor's talking points. Our opinions are nothing more. And all they do is to juice us up on whatever side we take. And in the meantime, nothing happens. We just gather together. The church gets together. And we banter back and forth. Who's the greater party? Who is better? And so on and so forth. And it goes on and on and on and on. In fact, more than ever, it's not about having our way. It's about having God's way. It's about doing what God wants us to do. And there are some things that we're going to look at in the scripture, but Micah clearly answers a question for us in Micah chapter 6 and in verse 8. What he's saying there is, this is what, God, what do you want from me? God would say, this is what I expect from you. This is what I expect. Oh, people, the Lord has told you what is good. Who's told us what is good? Fox News? The Supreme Court? No. God has told us what is good. And this is what he requires of you. To do what is right, to love mercy, to walk humbly with your God. That's a, not a difficult recipe at all. To do what is right, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Wow. That's what he's calling the church to do. Because in proclaiming the gospel... We're doing what is right, are we not? In proclaiming the gospel, are we not loving mercy? In proclaiming the gospel, are we not following the first and greatest commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind and might? Are we not doing those things? And are we not fulfilling the second commandment? Is this just like the first? That to love your neighbor as yourself? He calls us to a lifestyle of doing good, of seeking justice, of correcting injustice, to love mercy, to walk humbly with the awesome God that we just sung about. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns from heaven above. Thank God he does. But what he called us to do in light of what is going on in our nation, and I don't just mean with the, just this, these couple of decisions that came down this past week. But when you look at what has happened over time in our nation, you would think that in our streets today, after such a wonderful decision, that people would be out there, life, there's a stand for life. But we see both sides. There's no difference in what's happening in the streets of our nation today than what happened in Portland, in Seattle, and all around the world. People are rioting. People are screaming at one another. And it really goes to show us 
that in the middle of all this, it's like the aisle. This is the one side and this is the other side. And in the middle where the church ought to be, it's a blank aisle. No one's in the aisle. We've just taken a side against the other side. That doesn't change anything. It doesn't do what God is calling us to do. And so based upon what God is showing us, that we can see with our own eyes, that we can hear with our own ears, isn't it true that we ought to be doing what God wants us to do. And in fact, our call to do what God wants us to do just got ramped up a whole lot. I mean, this is like a monster energy drink for the church. And we ought to be doing those things. And God gives us a purpose for why he's calling us now, just like he was calling Micah and the people back then. What is the, what is the purpose or the teaching purpose behind this beautiful book of Micah. It's an analysis of the ills of society. This is what Micah is about. It provides the analysis of the ills of society and the responsibility of leadership in Israel and in Judah, both the citizens and the leadership, they were, they were corrupt. And there was corruption at every level of society back then. There is corruption at every level of society today. We don't change very much. You know, we, we, we might have worn different clothing back then. But I'll tell you what, clothes don't make the man. Unless, of course, you're me. Anyway. But here's the issue. What was going on? Everybody was cheating. Everyone was exploiting one another. They were oppressing somebody else. And that's true in, in so many nations today. And it's true in our nation right now. So Micah, by the command of God, sets this indictment against his own society. This must have been really something for Micah. And he stands here with this indictment and says, it's not only for Israel and Judah. This indictment is for every nation including the United States of America. It's for every state in that nation. It's for every community within every state. And most important, it's for every family within every community. Everybody is indicted. And his message is giving us essential truths here. And these are the essential truths. How you and I behave toward one another and toward others, that behavior matters. God says so. All of the social systems that are set up, they matter. Leadership and integrity and character of the person in that leadership, that matters to God. Justice and concern for the oppressed and for the poor, that matters to God. Sincere faith. And it's a shame that we even have, have to put that descriptive word, sincere faith. You can't even say faith anymore. But it is a true faith and a real worship that matters to God. Because what really matters to God in all of these things as we stir the pot here is that obedience to God and his word matter. And apart from obedience to God and his word, we will not have sincere worship or sincere faith. We will not have right justice and concern for the poor. Our leadership and our leaders will not have integrity. Our systems, whatever they may be, they will no longer matter to us. And so, because none of that matters, because I'm not paying attention to what real, what a real obedience to God and his word is, I can live as an individual and I can live whatever way I want to live. And is that not true for what's happening today in the world? You can follow this formula you can take it from A to Z, and you can take it from Z to A, and it all connects. So Micah tells us a fundamental truth. How we treat others is important. It's critical to Almighty God. I can yell and I can scream on everything that was right and everything that is just and everything that is in this word of God. As Tori and I were having a conversation this morning... She reminded me of 
1 Corinthians 13, we can do all those things, but if we have not love, we're nothing more than a clanging cymbal. That's it. A resounding gong. Nothing. It's like nails on a chalkboard. It's nothing. How we treat others is of critical importance to God. And I've said it before, I can be biblical without being biblical. We have to be careful. We can be biblical without being biblical. And 1 Corinthians 13 says, if there's no love, and they say it to the church in Ephesus, right? <laughs> Whoa, you guys do not tolerate bad teaching. You're sound. I mean, the church at Ephesus was a great church. And then Jesus says, but you got this one thing against you. You've left your first love. You've left me behind. And so what happens is, is that the more we get tied up in the rhetoric of the world, the more we begin to leave God behind. So we have to get back to asking God, not what we want, but God, what do you want? What is it? Because our individual behavior affects the moral and spiritual health of our culture, of our communities, and of our society. So the Lord cares so deeply about our personal behavior and the integrity of all our relations. Think of it. The unchurched. Remember what unchurched meant years ago? Unchurched used to mean it was people who did not want to go to church. It was people who had never been in church before. It was people who had never had a relationship with Almighty God at all. And so years ago, the, the, the big thing, the mantra was, we've got to reach the unchurched. Now it's changed. The unchurched is not people that who don't like church, who don't want to go to church, who have no relationship with the Lord. The unchurched are people who were in church for a number of years but they have become unchurched. It's like if, if you put handcuffs on me or chains and the chains were broken, I am chained, but now I am unchained. I was there. I was really tied to something. What happened to cause these people from being churched to unchurched? I'll tell you what happened. Individual behavior toward one another. What we said to others, how we behave to one another. And over time, that gets out. In fact, there's nothing perhaps worse than a reputation of a church that's unkind toward one another. And as this filters out, and the church, the people start to see the church and community, how are they going to behave? How are we going to behave toward those not only who We'd love to see come back to church, right? But how would we behave? What's our individual behavior toward those who do not know the Lord? Who believe some lie about the grace of Jesus Christ? Who have believed some lie about who the body of Christ really is? How we treat others is of critical importance and it matters to God. Micah is declaring that. How are we in our business toward one another? Fair and personal in our work relations. What about the needs of other people? Are we really concerned with the needs of the poor? The needs of the oppressed? Those who society would look at and say, no thank you. How would we look at them and say, well, you really don't match up who we are. In this place, there's probably a better place for you to be. Are we building people up? Or are we tearing them down? The other thing that Mike is teaching us is that God has a tremendous concern for justice. He wants justice at all levels of society. All levels of society. In fact, it's justice for all. Justice for all. This is what he wants. It's in our constitution, is it not? We say it with liberty and 
justice for all in our Pledge of Allegiance. Or actually saying what God wants for all people and all of the systems. It's not only where we live, it's not only where we work, but what about where we play? What about our recreation? You know, as I said before, I'm involved in the martial arts and I've been for a number of years and, and they have this, this code or this, this creed that they want people to, to, to learn. It's actually some biblical truths behind it, right? Develop self-discipline in order to bring out the best in myself and in others. It's one of them. Bring out self-discipline in order to bring out the best in me and in others. To use common sense rather than self-defense. But we're in a fight. And we're not even thinking about what God wants for us to do. So how, where do we get it from? Well, God must want us to do this. God wants us to do this because this is what I heard and so on and so forth. And we get all lathered up over the news reports and what the Supreme Court's doing. Thank God he's the one who tells us what we are to do. But he also teaches us that we are to have this sincere faith and that loving obedience matter. His word is to be obeyed. When we obey his word, we obey him. And the foundation of our faith is to walk daily with Almighty God, is it not? False religions have no power to change behavior. They don't. Not really. Now, you can be a Muslim and operate under Sharia law. If you don't behave according to that law, they'll just cut your head off. Or they'll beat you or they'll stone you or whatever they'll do. That's not real change in behavior. That's fear. But when the commands of God are followed, they change our behavior because they lead us to him. They lead us to a need for a savior. They develop not our own moral standards as the Muslims have developed or other nations have developed. But these moral standards are God's standards to live by. And again, we were having a conversation. It's amazing to see that, you know, when this nation was being built, the Ten Commandments were codified. They were codified. Where did that go? Right? We're talking about codifying laws for abortion. What had happened to the codification of the Ten Commandments? You just can't codify something and uncodify it at whim. It's illegal, as far as I know. What's happened here? We've allowed every false religion to dictate how we are to behave in this nation. And the church is on either side. We're nowhere in the aisle doing what God has called us to do. And so... False religions have at its core a superficial faith. They have a mindless religion that's born in ritual with a self-centered spirituality. That's all it is. And Micah is on fire with a message that God detests empty formal religion. He hates it. He wants more than anything sacrifice? No. More than anything our offerings? No. He wants obedience. Because when we obey him, we follow him. And that's a demonstration that we love him. If you obey me, you love me. If you obey me, you love me. And lastly, in this teaching here that Micah has, is that a true change of heart in individuals is required for any change to occur in society. There was this big, there was a book out years ago called Cultural Shift. And, and, and Cultural Shift said this, that the church can change the culture. No, it can't. God changes the culture. If we are his children, 
He has changed us, has he not? So we go out into the world and take that life change into the world. That people can see that there is a change in these people. But there's nothing that I can do. All I can do is to do what God wants me to do. And by his perfect and pleasing will, he will do what he chooses to do. And when he does, there is a cultural change that takes place. And so for years, the church was trying to go out and change the culture. And they thought the best way to do that was to be just like the culture. Sadly, the culture of the world has changed the culture of the church. And there's nothing different. That's not what God wants us to do. So are we really, with all of our hearts, diligently seeking him and seeking to obey the Holy Spirit of God who lives within us? People in every nation of every generation have turned away from the Lord. Isaiah testifies it. All we like sheep have gone astray. Each one of us. Each one of us. And so we followed our own path, our own way. But the good news is that the Lord laid on him, right, the iniquity of us all. And by his wounds we are healed. And so we see this case with Israel. I've given you my word. I've given you my commandments. I've given you salvation. I've asked you to do what is required of you, to love me. I've asked you to do what is required of you, to love the people that you are with. I've said to you to act justly. I've said to you, love mercy. I've said to you, walk humbly with me, the Lord God. But the people said, no. We won't have any of that. And they chased after what they wanted. And so they make their choices. And what did the choices that they may lead to? They found themselves mistreating one another. They found themselves cheating one another. They found themselves exploiting one another. They found themselves abusing one another. And God says, I have had it. I have had it. And so here we see this astonishing but shocking entry of a courtroom. And in, I, and in Micah chapter 6, look what he says. Hear now what the Lord says. He's speaking to his people. This is Israel and Judah. But I would say to you, he's speaking to his church today, right now. And he would say the same thing to us. Arise, plead your case before the mountains. What? Plead my case before the mountains and let the hills hear your voice. What? And then he just looks to the mountains and he says, Hear, O you mountains, the Lord's complaint. And you strong foundations of the earth. For the Lord has a complaint against his people. Wow, we think of the accuser of the brethren as Satan. But God is accusing his own people right now. He is the one who says to the people, you come before me right now. I have charges against you. There's an indictment. I've summoned all of my creation as my witnesses. And you're going to listen to the charges that I have against you. Oh, my people, what have I done to you? This is God now speaking. Can you imagine? Here's Israel and Judah. Can you imagine just us, and if all the churches, he summoned all the churches, and he looks at every one of us, and all I can think of is Peter. Peter is in a courtyard. Jesus is being abused horribly. 
He's being beaten. He's being spit upon. They're slugging him. They're slapping him. They're pulling his beard out. They're striking him with whips. He's tied and he's bound. Just when he has enough breath, they come and they kick him again in the ribs. Peter is in the courtyard. He is having nothing of that. And here are these groups. And they said, he is one of them. Yes, we know you are one of his followers. And Peter begins to deny him, begins to curse him. He's using foul language against Christ and saying that he vehemently denies, no, I do not know this man. And he looks. And Christ looks right at him. And the words of Christ come to mind. Because he heard. I tell you the truth, Peter. You will deny me three times. And then you'll hear this rooster crow. And as Peter looked in his eyes, what did he say? Hatred from Jesus? No. Contempt from Jesus? This is the courtyard of love. Their eyes meet. And Peter knows what he has done. And what he is gazing into. Is the loving face of Christ. That says I will never leave you. And I will never forsake you. And Peter can't handle it. He weeps bitterly. Bitterly there. We're summoned before almighty God. And he asks us these words, O oh, my people, what have I done to you? What have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? How have I wearied you? Testify against me. That's what God says. You testify against me. For my people... I brought you up from the land of Egypt. I redeemed you from the house of bondage. And I sent you, and I, and I, and, and I, I sent before you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. O my people, remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him? From Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. With what shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, 10,000 rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you Oh man, what is good? And what does the Lord require of you? But to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Here we are assembled before Almighty God. And He says there is no substitute for obedience. He lists some very serious charges against his people. And he speaks directly to them. You know, sometimes folks have left the church and said, Boy, you were really speaking to me today. No, I wasn't. God was. Please don't ever put me in the place of God. I don't. Boy, you really got under me, under my feathers today. No, I didn't. The Spirit of God did. Boy, you really blessed me today. No, I didn't. God did. He works in so many beautiful ways when the word of God is proclaimed. And so he speaks directly to them. They were guilty of committing crimes against the Lord and one another. And here's the interesting thing. 
Why would God call the mountains and the hills and ask the foundations of the earth to all be present here? Because not only did the people sin against God and against one another, but God says, you have marred my own creation. You have sinned against my creation. In other words, you have, est- you have taken the order that would I have established and you have created your own order. You have sinned against creation. It's pretty interesting that we can look at nature all the way in the beginning and that from every fruit-bearing tree, seed from that seed, from every animal, seed from that seed, from every plant, seed from that seed, from the birds of the air to the fish of the sea, seed of that seed. But we have said, no. No longer do we need a man and a woman. We'll do what we want with the seed that you have given. We will kill it or we will change it to fit our ways. And God says, I call you to testify before me. I've made you male and I've made you female, we have destroyed the established order of Almighty God in this nation. And we have said that God blesses that. No, he does not. His word serves as an indictment against all who would believe such things. And so we have this courtroom And these serious charges. But he commands the people to listen. When I used to go to the court and bring people before the judge, usually it was the people that had a little bit too much. But even others that were not happy, the judge would be speaking and they would try to talk. And the judge would say to them, be quiet. All I want you to do right now is to listen to what you are being charged with. Do you understand? Now is not the time for opinions. There'll be another date when we can have a trial or discuss that. But right now, you listen to what I am saying to you. And at the end of the charges being read... The judge would say to the person or the people, do you understand what you are being charged with? Yes, your honor. God is saying to his people, I don't want to hear a word from you right now. Nothing. Because I want you to understand what you're being charged with. You need to understand the charges being leveled against you. And so... He gives them the charges. He summons the mountains to bear witness. And then, after they are, have their charges, he says, now I want you to plead your case. You know the charges. Now it's time for you to plead your case. You have sinned against me. You have sinned against my laws, you have sinned against my creation. Now, you plead your case before my creation. You plead your case before the mountains. You plead your case before the foundation of the world. You plead your case with the hills here. It's pretty amazing. It's the Lord of the mountains. It's the Lord of all creation who is speaking To his people. What a scene that must have been. But now he directs the mountains to become witnesses. Now, this is not just poetic imagery here, not at all. The mountains and the foundations of the earth 
represent the perfect impartiality of Almighty God. They stand as total objective truth here as witnesses. Their veracity could be tested throughout. They would be dependable about, upon, beyond reproach. And so this is the perfect witness. This is the jury that you would want to have. You would want God's mountains and hills and his foundations as your witnesses and as your jury. This is who God has. This was because the earth and nature and creation itself bore witness to the people's crimes. The earth had been observed for centuries what people were doing to it. And so they could confirm the Lord's accusations. That's pretty amazing. So God, even more than the mountains though, and his perfect righteousness levels the charges. Job says, for his eyes are upon the ways of man and he sees all his goings. If you think that God does not see anything, he sees everything everything, our comings and our goings. For there is not a word in my tongue, but lo, O Lord, thou knowest it all together, Psalm 139. And so he levels these severe charges against the people. What are the charges? Verses three through five. O my people, what have I done to you? And how have I wearied you? Testify against me. For I brought you up from the land of Egypt, I redeemed you from the house of bondage. I sent you Moses, Aaron, and Miriam, O my people. Remember what Balak, king of Moab, counseled, and what Balaam, the son of Beor, answered him from Acacia Grove to Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. What is all of this that he is saying here? He says tenderly to his people, my people, have I burdened you? What have I done to you? Have you ever heard that from one another, by the way? What have I done to you? I mean, please let me know. But, but I don't know. What, what have I done to you? Have I burdened you? These are some startling questions from God himself. He's asking us these questions because it reveals something. What God is actually saying to his people, I have become a burden to you. How have I done that? What have I done to put a heavy yoke upon you? What have I done to you? Hmm. God begins to reveal through his own charges the hard-hearted and ungratefulness of what happened to his people. They no longer loved him. He had formed them into a strong nation, didn't he? He did. He made them his own people. He did. But they just wanted to do as they pleased. You're a burden to us, God. Your law is a burden to us. I don't need your word to guide me. I don't need your word to show me how I ought to live. What about this covenant that he established? Aren't you glad that we have an everlasting covenant in the blood of Jesus Christ? It can never be broken. It's been codified, if you will, in heaven, in the blood of Jesus Christ. When you got up this morning... Did you ever think of how protected you are? Of how blessed you really are? Of what he has really done for you? But Israel, the church today? No. Because ever since we were delivered from bondage, like Israel, what have we done with that blessing? The blessing of salvation. As soon as Israel is delivered from bondage of, of slavery in Egypt, you can read the record. They began to rebel against God. You would think that they would be more and more and more in love with him and more and more wanting to follow him. Come on. But they have become unchurched. They were unchained and they became unchurched. We got saved and I've got heaven and I've got eternal life with Jesus. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. 
So I don't need the church. I don't need the body of Christ. I can do whatever I want to do. And I can look at this word of God and I can make it say whatever I want it to say. And I can do that, and so can you, to justify my own sin. And so by Micah's day, the nation of Israel were an obstinate, corrupt people. And God was no longer a blessing to them, but he is a burden. And I dare say today in this nation, God's no longer a blessing to the nation of America. He's a burden to us. Just look at what we say. So the people forgot God's love. In verses 4 and 5, they were ungrateful for what he had done. How he had proven his great love for them throughout history. They failed to remember and appreciate all his acts of salvation. It's just not one act that saved us. Though it is, but there are acts of salvation. Let me clarify that. It's the cross. It's, it's the death of Jesus Christ. But what is that it? No, there are continual acts of salvation. The Lord delivered them from slavery in Egypt. Did he not? And then after that, he gave them faithful leaders to guide them. By his own words. He says, I gave you Moses. I gave you Aaron. I gave you Miriam. And many other leaders down through the century. These are acts of salvation. He saved them. He got them out of bondage. He brought them faithful leaders to lead them. Look at what's happened in the church. He's taken us out of the bondage of sin. And we have faithful leaders that are supposed to be leading the church. But Anita and I were just talking this past Wednesday. We we're talking about the, the prosperity gospel. And now pastors, even in a land like Africa, where there's so much need for the true gospel, for the true blessings of salvation, they care more about material things now than the heavenly treasures. But then, right, you can go to the next village over that have none of the material blessings and are really worshiping the Lord. They're following him because they know that he loves them and he provides for them. And even if they could barely find a morsel of food, they know this. To look at the birds of the air and their heavenly father will provide more that he will clothe them. You might not have $500 pair of sneakers. But thank God there's something on the soles of your feet. To walk these, these rocky roads. I might not have the big Cadillac. Or the, the big SUV. Whatever they are over here. The Bentley and the Rolls Royces. That God help those pastors. That are squandering the church's money. And over here, perhaps these people would be happy if they would be put in a cart to be pulled somewhere else or a bicycle that works. We have forgotten the acts of God's salvation. And even Jeremiah says, Woe to the shepherds who lead you astray. Those are convicting words. We forget about the protection of the enemies that that we are being saved from. Back then it was Balak, king of Moab. Balak sought three times to get Balaam to curse Israel, but the Lord protected his people. And in the book of Numbers chapter 22 and 24, you can see that God turned all of that into blessings for his people. But they forgot about that. They didn't care to, to even understand those things anymore. And they forgot about the Lord's faithfulness in guiding them to the promised land. The words from Shechem to Gilgal reminded the people of the miraculous crossing over the Jordan River. And even the leader that God gave to the people in Joshua after the death of Moses. A faithful leader who guided them to the promised land. And God stops there. He had a whole ark full of saving acts, I'm sure. Of how we delivered them time and time again. To a special homeland, the promised land. But the people had forgotten. They neglected him. They belittled him. 
and they discounted his salvation. They were a most ungrateful people. But the beautiful thing is this. God looks at us today. And in spite of our ingratitude toward him, today, just as it was in Micah's day, as much as unbelievers and believers ignore the word of God, the free gift of salvation through Christ, that we go about doing our daily affairs, whatever we want to do, Never forget, God says, what I have done on your behalf. Don't ever forget that. And so this morning, I know Gail sent out a, a list we were talking a little while ago. And we got talking about the, the importance of adoring God. It was Wednesday night, Marshall was there. And it's just to come with adoration toward God. And that was born out of just a time of prayer that I had with me, me and God alone. And I began to walk and to just recite the attributes of God. And they came more and more and more and more. And so she said that I challenge you as well to take that. And don't just look at well, those words there that are there. Those are, some, those are some introductory things. But open up the word of God and look at the characteristics and the attributes of God. And write them down. And begin then to look at the scripture that testifies of those things. And to praise God into that. And to adore Almighty God. And I would challenge you in this as well. When you got up this morning, did you consider at all any of the acts of God toward you? I would say to you, that every day we ought to do that. How? What, is God a burden to me? He considers me one of his children. He considers you his children. He considers the church his children. And so we look at what's going on and all of the rhetoric and the hate. And in the midst of all of that is this aisle. To step out of whatever side you're on. And to get into the aisle where God is. You say, God, what do you want from me? This is your case against me. But what do you want? I am so, you fill in the blank. I can't take this much more. And God would say, I know that. You're laboring. You've got a heavy burden on you. So what's God's answer? What do I do? Come unto me, Jesus said, all you that labor and are heavy laden. God says, you won't get any rest from the world. You won't get any rest from the legislation that's being passed. Because someone's going to change it sooner or later. No, he says, you come to me and I will give you rest. Oh, soul. Are you weary? You come to Jesus Christ. But God, I've gone so far. I have become unchurched. Oh, I show up on Sundays, but I am really unchurched. He says, let me tell you something. This is my blood of the New Testament, the covenant, which is shed for you. Don't ever forget the covenant in his blood for you. He shed it for you. It's a promise. It is a commitment. It can never be broken. So you go to him. You who are heavy. Laden and burdened and need rest. You go in the covenant of the blood of Jesus Christ. And you come. To drink of the water that he desires to give. But whosoever drink the water that I shall give him shall never thirst. But the water I shall give him shall be 
in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life. God says, not only will I give you rest, that is part of the acts of salvation. Not only have I saved you with my blood, the act of salvation, but the other acts of salvation is that I will fill you with living waters and you shall never thirst again. But God, he says, no, 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 no. Don't let anybody lie to you. Let me tell you what I say to you. This is the will of him that sent me, that everyone which, which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I will raise him up on the last day. He says, not only have I saved you and given you abundant life and eternal life, I will raise you up on the last day, but I will give you rest today. I will satisfy you with, with living waters. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved, shall be rescued. God, what do you want from me? The Lord's very clear. He wants us to come back to him. To come back to him. He's not a burden. But he lifts the burden off. He's not one who sends us out unprotected, but he protects us. He's not one who would leave you without leadership and guidance. No, he has given that leadership and guidance to us. So I would challenge you today to come back to the Lord. Perhaps to even remember from how far we have fallen. But like Peter in that courtyard of love, the Lord just looks at him with love. And we know that after his resurrection, he said to Peter, do you love me, Peter? Peter said, yes, I love you, Lord. Feed my sheep. Peter, do you love me? Yes, Lord, I love you. Then tend to my lambs. Peter, do you love me? Lord, you know that I love you. Then feed my sheep. What God gave to Peter, he never took away. In spite of his denial of him, in spite of whatever we have broken away from, God, what do you want? You come back to me. I told you I have something for you. I've never taken it away from you. Come back and be restored to the glory of God. Let us be restored. And our Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you, Father, that we can never break your love. We thank you, Lord, that you do bring charges against us. But the devil... He has no footing. The world cannot bring charges, but you can. And so, Lord, when you bring your charges, make us still that we can know what we are charged with. And answer the questions, Lord. No. To repent of those things we are being charged with. And then, Father, confess those sins and come back into your fellowship. And we thank you for your grace for your mercy and for your abounding love toward us, your children. In Jesus' name, amen.
brings us back together again. The Lord bless you and the Lord keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and the Lord be gracious unto you. And the Lord incline his face toward you and grant to you today his peace now and forevermore. And all of God's people said, amen. 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 God bless you.